in this video we are going to continue talking about the topics of chapter 5. Here we are going to start our discussion talking about another technique that utilizes the basis of column chromatography. This technique it is called ion exchange chromatography. Understanding ion exchange chromatography, we are going to be utilizing the basis of the charge of our peptide or protein in order to purify it. There are two types of ion exchange chromatography. There is anion exchange chromatography and cation exchange chromatography. The difference between them is what type of analyte we can separate and the type of stationary phase that we can utilize. As you can see in the left side, anion exchange has a stationary phase that specifically that stationary phase particle is positively charged. It is called anion exchange because your analyte is an anion. In the case of cation exchange, stationary phase particle, understand that for that one, your stationary phase particle is negatively charged. Because understand that the analyte, what you're trying to purify it, is going to be positively charged. So if we look at the image that we have on the right side, it actually illustrates how specifically our cation exchange chromatography will work. I'm going to zoom in in it so we can look at the details of the different steps. So again, this is an example of cation exchange chromatography. So if we look at this different columns, let's say that we have a particular mixture of proteins. If I look overall at the mixture of proteins, I'm just gonna zoom in in the first column. And I look at their overall charge, the protein, I'm going to label them in color. So this one, I'm going to color purple. And the one that it is purple, when I actually add the charges, it looks like overall it is positive two. I am gonna color the second one red. And when I look and I add the overall charges, it looks like this protein, its overall charge is zero. When I look at this third sample right here, that it looks yellowish, but it's an orange color of the highlighter, understand that when I add those charges, the overall charge of that protein is negative two. So in a cation exchange chromatography, because my bead is negatively charged, I expect that the like charges are going to repel each other. And if we look at the overall picture and how these different proteins are going to be passing through the system, you can see that already in the column we have sodium in it, which is the cation that is sitting there. Let's say that these proteins are navigating through the stationary phase, which as you can see, it is negatively charged. As you can see in the second illustration, the protein that has a charge of negative two was eluded first. Coming second out of the column, we have the one that is neutral.
and the one that's stuck most in the column is the one that is positive too. As you can imagine, if you have light charges, they will repel. If you have opposite charges, they will interact. So as we look at the process of how are these mixtures of proteins coming out, it makes sense that the one that is the same charge of the bead is eluded at first. Then the one that is neutral is going to be eluded second. And the one that is eluded last is going to be the one that overall is going to be positively charged. Because as you can see in the last drawing, this that is overall positive too was the one that stuck around our session interface a little bit longer because it has the opposite charge to the bead. Let's say that we actually put that in practice just by separating a mixture of amino acids. So as you can see, this is just another example. So instead of the protein level, we're looking at amino acids. We have a cation exchange bead. As I explained previously, if you have a cation exchange bead, the yellow is the negative charge in the bead. So I'm just symbolizing it by putting a negative charge. Notice that sulfite in this case is going to be towards the end, um, or it is the anion that is present there. So let's say that we add a mixture of amino acids, okay? Now, aspartic acid, we know that it is an acidic, but it tends to be negatively charged because it gets ionized. So the side chain of that amino acid is negative. Serine is polar, but is neutral. So its side chain does not have any charge. Lysine, its side chain is positively charged as we have observed in previous chapters. So if we have a cation exchange chromatography, remember the bead is negative. If we are going to pass this mixture of amino acids, how are they going to be eluded? Well, as you can see here, as we add more cation, that's where the sodium cation comes from, we expect that the aspartic acid, because it's the least positively charged, it gets eluded first. The serine, because remember, Overall, it is neutral, it gets eluded next. Lastly, lysine, because it's positively charged, it will be eluded fast or eluded last. And that's pretty much how in a cation exchange chromatography works. If you had an anion exchange, then pretty much what we have is the opposite in terms of elution. Next, let's talk about section 5.3, which specifically, this is where we are doing analysis of our sample. So as you can see, in all the videos that we have talked so far is, okay, overall, when we are trying to study a protein of interest, we need to put the DNA in a vehicle, we need to express it. After we express it, we need to lyse those cells. Then we have to purify, 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 quantify, continue purification until we have our protein. Now, how do we actually analyze it? Well, there's going to be different techniques. The first thing that we could do is actually analyze it by looking at the molecular weight to see, did we really purify what we want? Do we have other contaminants after all our purification steps? One of the ways that we could do that is by electrophoresis. Understand that in the process of electrophoresis, what we are looking at is that charged particles are going to migrate in an electric field towards opposite charge. So if we look specifically at this image, these lines right here are going to represent each of them, 
this is a protein sample one, protein sample two, protein sample three, and so on and so forth. So again, PS is going to be my protein sample. Now, when it comes to electrophoresis, understand that this is going to specifically align these samples based on molecular weight. And in a few moments, I'm going to illustrate how it actually looks like in the gel. Understand that there's a particular type of gel that it is utilized for these experiments. So electrophoresis medium can be utilized um, as agarose gel, which is mostly utilized in um, nucleic acid technology. The one that is utilized in proteins is mostly polyacrylamide. As you can see structurally, they are very different from one another. While agarose is more of a sugar-based medium, polyacrylamide is going to be a polymer that it has many amide bonds, and you can see it from the structure. But when it comes to electrophoresis, Understand that that is called a PAGE technique because PAGE basically stands for polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. So page is P A G E. That's where the page comes from. Now there are two different types of page. Okay. And as I was mentioning, if we look at what the gel actually looks like, which is here, notice that when a sample runs, we can actually see it lined up based on molecular weight in which you know that the larger are on the top the lighter are in the bottom because as you can see we go from large numbers all the way to the, uh, small numbers so what is the difference between SDS page and native page is basically how your sample looks like in SDS page, we are using a chemical, or the SDS comes from sodium dodecyl sulfate. That's what SDS comes from. And what SDS does is that it basically is going to denature the protein. And again, it's not like one is better than the other. Both techniques are utilized. It depends on what you're trying to do. But the difference between these two is that you can see in SDS, you have unfolded protein. In native, you have folded protein. So they look different, but at the end of the day, all we're trying to visualize is your protein sample in terms of molecular weight. Understand that kilodaltons, KDA, is the unit for protein molecular weight there is one more technique that we can utilize in order to do protein analysis and that is isoelectric focusing on proteins okay in this technique proteins are separated by the isoelectric point we already learned that isoelectric point is the pi Okay, if that isoelectric uh, focusing experiment is followed by electrophoresis, we can also look at the size of the protein. So remember, this is because isoelectric focusing of protein is followed by electrophoresis. So we do two experiments. 
Now, as you may remember from previous chapters, pretty much what we're taking into account in this technique is that we know the pH at which our protein has no net charge. So if you put a protein sample and you know the isoelectric point for the different proteins or even more importantly the one that you're interested in at a particular pH you know that your protein will migrate there and is a way in which we can isolate it.